Hi, my name is Denis Villeneuve. I'm the director of Dune, and this is Notes on a Scene. The test is simple. Remove your hand from the box, and you die. Notes in the box. Pain. So this is a very iconic scene taken out of the book. Paul Atreides, the hero of the book, will go through some very specific test called the Gum Jabbar. And it's a test that is designed to see if his humanity will overcome his animal impulses. Defiance in the eyes, like his father. Leave us. I deeply love the idea to start a, a sci-fi movie in a library. I think that, that the counterpoint of it is, is kind of beautiful. Why a library? It says a lot of things about Dune's world. There's no computers in this world. In Dune's world, AI has been banned. There's no more artificial intelligence. It's, uh, Dune is about the triumph of the human spirit. Patrice Vermette designed an insane amount of beautiful carpets in order to bring the idea of ancient culture. As you can see, the chairs are, are, are be designed. So the Reverend Mother looks almost like a chess figure. I asked Greg Fraser, the cinematographer, to bring a level of darkness in the scene that will feel almost like you are like uh, having a nightmare. And it's exactly what I had in mind when I read the book at 14 years old. This scene happened right uh, uh, at the beginning of the shoot. It was one of the first scenes I, 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 I shot with uh, Timothée Chalamet, Rebecca Ferguson, and of course, the great Charlotte Rankling. I loved working with these actors. They were absolutely amazing. And frankly, after that scene, I started to breathe because I knew that I had did cast the right casting. Leave us. You must do everything the mother of a mother tells you. She's supposed to be in control of her emotion. She's almost about to hug him, almost ab about to touch him, but she cannot allow herself to do that because she's in front of the mother superior. Her having to brought her own son into a test that could mean his death. It shows the tension between the motherhood and being a Bene Gesserit sister. You dismiss my mother in her own house. Come here, kneel. Here, several things are happening. The Bene Gesserit can use something uh, called as the voice in order to control the other human's will. Meaning that here, the Reverend Mother using this voice can channel and go into the Paul Atreides subconscious and ask him to cross the room and kneel in front of her. I thought at the beginning that it could look silly if Timothée had to cross the room like a zombie. And it came into my mind to embrace right away from the beginning the point of view of the character and to fall into a very short period of time in some kind of micro coma, like a narcolepsy that will snap and he will just awaken in front of her. To create that feeling of narcolepsy, we thought that what could be interesting is to make very strong, powerful dollies, camera movement, at the same time switching off the lights of the room. I brought this idea in order to create that feeling of uh, disorientation and vertigo. And as we are moving the camera, we are not touching the focus, so it means that the, the characters are diving into the out-of-focus zone of the image. And also, I must say, it's great editing. Joe cut it, it, it had to be very, very fast. So it's really like a blink. We feel disorienting and, and, and destabilizing for the audience, like if they had been themselves victim of the voice. You dismiss my mother in her own house. Come here, kneel. The voice itself of the Reverend Mother, that came with a lot of experiments. Uh, I was obsessed by the idea that when you use a voice, you, you, should, you should be... Um, channeling ancient voice inside yourself. I love the idea that you will channel the voice of very ancient, powerful grandmothers. And uh, maybe it says a lot of things about my own family background, but it's something that I thought was like very powerful and, and fresh idea. I think it's pretty meaningful. How dare you use the voice on me? I deeply love the veil. The idea was to create a feeling of a distant, a, a religious feeling as well. It's a, a religious congregation. And I wanted to, to have the feeling that there's something about like the medieval nuns, that to have a feeling of uh, someone that is uh, above reality. At the end of the day, it just felt deeply right. Charlotte Rampling was not supposed to wear the veil through all the scene, but quickly I realized that it created this very strong mystery and she just looked definitely more powerful 
and I decided to shoot the whole scene with it, knowing that I had one of the best actresses in the world hiding almost her face, but I thought it was because I was just seeing her powerful eyes behind. I thought it was definitely the way to do it. Put your right hand in the box. The box, one of the very iconic objects. I said to my team, it's not an expression of our take on the book. I want Frank Herbert to be on the screen. We basically went with the description that was in the book, bringing a feeling of something ancient, something dangerous, something that cast uh, uh, shadows inside. For me, I didn't want to use any visual effects for this scene. I really wanted it to be like a mantle scene, meaning that it will be a scene that will uh, uh, rely into the acting of the actors and that the, the actors uh, will express uh, the inner pain without having the help of any visual effects. Your mother bade you obey me. Greg and I tried to create a feeling of oppression and making sure that the room felt closing on Paul, that is, there is no way to escape. The Reverend Mother is designed to make sure that she will look like towering over him. The box was designed so it fit exactly, so we will feel that the end is kind of trapped inside him. Honestly, frankly, it's one of my favorite shots of the movie. Why? Because it's all there. You have the power of Charlotte Rampling, the Reverend Mother, towering over Paul. And there will be here a connection, a mental connection, where Paul will experience tremendous amount of pain coming from uh, 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 nerve induction, like hypnotism. There's something, uh, kind of a sacred quality to this scene. The science fiction here is more about uh, the evolution of the human brain. And I think it's like, it's all about that. This is what Dune is about. I hold at your neck the gom java, a poison needle, instant death. Here in that specific moment, I wanted Charlotte to jump on him like a, a snake. It needed to be surprising and, and at, at, at a superior speed. We had a great time designing those needles. I wanted them to be ancient. We rehearsed with Charlotte Renting to have to find that position. That was the way I imagined. Charlotte holding the needle. And uh, for me, there's something very delicate and very powerful, like a scorpion right now, ready to strike. And it's a very feminine position, but in the same time, it's all Beth. And I thought that was, that it was something saying, something interesting about the Bene Gesserit. The feeling of it is, it's a, closer to a, a period movie, more than a, to a sci-fi. There's something historical. And we try to protect that, that uh, quality in the costume design and, and the, some elements of the set design and definitely in, in, the, in the props too. It was important for me to, to keep roots into our reality and still uh, having a projection on something that uh, is a bit mad. The test is simple. Remove your hand from the box and you die. It's in the box. Pain. No need to call the guards. Your mother stands behind that door. No one will get past her. I love the beginning of the inner conflict going into Lady Jessica's mind. Paul's character is understanding that first it, he has been trapped, but it, that more importantly, it has been trapped by his own mother. That will create a tension that will go through the whole movie after. Why are you doing this? An animal caught in a trap will gnaw off its own leg to escape. What will you do? That's a line that is taken straight from the book. There's so, so much great lines in, in the book, uh, uh, of course. Every time I had a question or, 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 or a doubt, I always went back to the book. Even as I was shooting, even when I was editing, as we were composing the music, as Hans as Zimmer was doing the music, we were always going back to the book, reading the book. I mean, the, together, I mean, it was like the Bible. It was the, the early words. I mean, it was like the way to, to stay in contact with, with uh, Frank Herbert. I have deep, deep, deep respect and admiration for him. He's one of my favorite authors. And, and I, I wanted to make sure if he had seen this film movie, he would have feel that love. A tiny clue that there's something happening in deep inside that box that we have no idea what, what it is, but the way Tsmati moved gently his hand here is like, for me, dead perfect. This is exactly uh, the intention that I asked him to do. 
in this moment, just like a tiny, tiny suggestion that he's starting to feel something inside that doesn't feel right. Oh. <laughs> Silence. I will say uh, for the, the, the record, Timothy was afraid of Charlotte Rampling for real. <laughs> oh. It's not fair. It's not fair. I must not fear. Probably the most famous word coming out of the book. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. It's like a litany, the fear. John Spate and I had the idea that it will be said by the mother outside the, uh, 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 of the room that we will go back and forth uh, between and the mother and the son uh, to install this idea that this movie will be about their relationship. It was one of the first scenes that I did with Rebecca Ferguson here. And I asked uh, Rebecca to experience like a kind of quiet, sheer panic. She will slowly, by slowly, being able to control the emotion. For me, Rebecca Ferguson is a Stradivarius. I mean, her level of precision is absolutely insane. And I got exactly what I needed in order to express what I wanted to do with this scene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we hear the sound here that is coming from a combination of uh, Hans Zimmer that designed, that designed for this, this moment in the movie one of the more, most arrowing and unbearable score ever written for, for a scene where you have the impression to be at the dentist. Mm. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings obliteration. Mm. Here again, what's one of my favorite sounds of the movie. It's actually a Hans Zimmer sound. Mm -hmm. I think it's made out of a kind of crazy scream from human voices that are like compressed a billion times. And it's like Hans drove his team crazy with those sounds. And I'll face my fear and I'll permit it to pass over me, Mr. Me. So here, it's a very, 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 very important key moment in the scene, which is that Paul is put under so much pain, something deep inside the subconscious that was hidden there will go closer to the surface. The presence of the what we call the Kwisatz Adarak, a kind of a sup, uh, super being. I think that in this scene, we have to feel that the Reverend Mother will love to kill Paul, but she will not because she will witness something here. In this very specific moment, we can see in Charlotte Rampling's eye here that she has doubt, that she's the birth of a fear that he could be maybe the one. The scene becomes, uh, uh, it was before like a kind of uh, um, a duel. We were like uh, shifting from the river mother to Paul, uh, having them in confrontation mode, having them in a dirty double shot, meaning that you have the presence of the other character in the foreground, try to create a feeling of oppression. Paul is taking the upper side of the scene, coming out from this very specific close up where we felt that he channeled something that was, he was not expecting. I decided to push the camera on Timothée Chalamet, so we will feel that he's now taking power in the scene. In the book, the idea of fire is important. Paul is supposed to feel that his end is burning. And he didn't want to have like uh, CGI flames or uh, any suggestions. I, I, went, I, I, I went for mental suggestion. We designed that burnt end here that was made out of a real end and uh, we applied on it in, in CGI like a texture of burnt wood. I think it's a, a pretty uh, uh, powerful and striking image that was added later in the editing process. <laughs> Here we are hearing the uh, the voice of a singer that was a piece written by Anne Zimmer. Joe Walker and I, my editor, we had the idea to 
put it, put this voice on top of the scenes. The idea was to enhance the feeling of uh, uh, Paul starting to be possessed by some kind of very strong female power. And at the same time, to have like, to create what I will dare to see, like a curve of, the, of a, some kind of weird, uh, uh, painful orgasm that goes to a limit at one point where the Reverend Mother will feel that she went too far and she has to stop because she's feeling that the more she's pushing him, the more he resists and the more he resists, the more something else is strangely happening inside him and that the scene uh, is shifting in, in his, in his uh, um, uh, advantages. And here I will remain. Here, it's one of my favorite shots of the movie too. It's like, this is the end of uh, Zendaya playing Shani. The more I was shooting with Zendaya, the more I was inspired and I started to improvise in the desert shots that I knew that I will use uh, later in the dream sequences. And this shot of a female hand covered with blood holding a Chris knife for me was the most powerful poetic way to bring the idea of a, a holy war, an event that uh, Paul will fear to the whole story, the idea that tremendous amount of violence and, and, and the pain uh, will come out of, of uh, his journey. I wanted these visions to be as close to our dream, own dream experience. I thought that it would be very dramatically interesting to have a, a character that uh, has awakened visions, but doesn't have the key to understand the puzzle. Enough. For the first time, I think I did this movie for a single audience member, which is me. I uh, read the book 40 years ago. I deeply fall, felt in love with it. I was aware that there are millions of hardcore fans of the book out there, but uh, I took up on my shoulder to deal with the one that I, the, I was the most afraid of, which is me. Uh, I was a teenager that was a, a totalitarian dreamer. I was arrogant. I was pretentious. I had big dreams. It was kind of frightening for me. And I will say that the truth is as any movies, is, uh, movies are made of uh, victories and failures. Uh, there's some moments in Dune that uh, I knew uh, I, I was not good enough. There's others that I feel that I was very close to the original dream. And the gum Jabbar scene is definitely one that I knew that at 14 years old, I would have been okay with that. 